One of the great castles of history must be said to be that of Castle Fürstenstein, now in Poland. It is one shrouded in mystery and tragedy, and I want to share with you the actual full history of the castle's life from beginning up till today, including the myths stemming from the Second World War. Most people have heard of the elaborate tunnel or bunker complexes constructed under the castle. These we will visit in detail. But let's start with the top and from the beginning with the history of the castle. Twelve eighty eight was the first written mention of the castle, a time during which many strategically significant defensive castles were built by Bolo the First, Prince of Sushnitsa and Zhavo. The castle was known as the key to Silesia. The newly built fortress distinguished itself from others not only by its militant and vestigious position, but also from its picturesque location in the heart of the forest on a mountaintop. Bolo I also conferred upon himself title Lord of Chance, which his successors also held. In 1392, after the extinction of the Piasts from Mishunitsha Javoline, the Czech kings from Luxembourg dynasty became the castle's new owner by virtue of secession treaty. Later, in 1463, Fürstenstein belonged to the Czech king Jif George. In 1482, the castle came under the authority of the Hungarian king Matthias Covinius, as was governed by the commander of his army, George von Stein. It was this officer who first brought about changes to the castle's character, from that of a fortress to one of an actual castle, transforming the majority of its defensive arenas into residential ones. From 1497 to 1508, the castle belonged to Vladislaus II, the Czech and Hungarian king. Later, the ruler transferred the castle property to his chancellor, Johann von Hungwich. From 1509, for an undisclosed son, Johann von Hungwich transferred the castle to its neighboring property, the knight Konrad I von Hoberg. In 1605, Conrad III von Hochberg received from the Emperor Rudolf III the right of inheritance to the castle. The castle became the hereditary property of the Hochberg line. From 1705 to 1742, Konrad Ernst Maximilian von Hochberg initiated what became the first great castle reconstruction. During that time, there arose distinctively baroque exterior the honorary courtyard and buildings near the entrance to the castle. On the Poblar Heights, the summer pavilion was also constructed, becoming the family mausoleum in the second half of the 19th century. From 1789 to 1833, Hans Heinrich developed the castle in immediate surroundings. Christian Wilhelm de Wichstein's plan provided for new structure, as well as imitation ruins of medieval fortifications known as the Old Castle, which is today in ruins of the Second World War, where it was destroyed by the Russian army. In 1856, Hans Heinrich XI became the new master of the castle, and would go on to be one of the outstanding figures in the castle's history, Count von Hochberg and later Prince of Pless. Hans Heinrich XI brought about a vast number of initiatives for the local population and the castle park. Some were the establishment of roads, parks, wooded areas, the creation of free cooking schools for the daughters of Albrecht miners, organizer of evening classes for young workers, and support for those in the parish, regardless of their faith or financial means. He provided for burials and help for those who needed medical care, and the widowed, disabled, and elderly. The Hochberg family was strongly committed to helping the poorest and the end of the 19th century, an interesting note was that Hans Heinrich XI's reforms became the basis of the German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck's later social reforms. In December 1891, 
His son, Hans Heinrich XII, married Marie Theresa Cornwallis West, known today as Princess Daisy. Queen Victoria herself conferred her personal blessings upon the newly married couple. Princess Daisy, a woman well ahead of her time, was to become one of the best-known figures in the history of the castle. To this day, her story is quite fascinating. Her memoirs contain an unusual description of the relations that prevailed the Hochberg family, as well as a great deal of information about the period through which the princess lived. From 1907 to 1938, the period where Hans Heinrich XV ruled the castle, the son of Hans Heinrich XI, brought about what is now known as the Second Great Castle Reconstruction. In the years 1908 to 1923, there arose a neo-Renaissance west and north wings. The tower was to reach a height of 47 meters, covered by a domed helmet with a lantern. The castle terraces took their present shape. In 1908, the Hochbergs also began the construction of the Walburg Palmhaus, presented it for his wife, Princess Daisy. From 1941, the Nationalist Socialist government in Germany confiscated the castle. During the Second World War, the collection of Berlin's Royal Prussian Library was kept in the castle. It should be pointed out that Daisy and Hans Heinrich's sons fought against the German army, Hans Heinrich XVII in the British forces and Alexander in the Polish army. From 1943 to 1945, the Tod organization occupied the castle, and from here, large underground construction project began under the castle, one that is to this day still fraught in mystery, as there are several rumors as to its use, but none seem to make much sense once faced with what was actually constructed. Intense work was carried out, including what was said to be one of Hitler's main quarters, or it was said to be for the use of the foreign officer Ribbentrop. The changes to the castles and under it during this period is referred to as the third castle reconstruction, where large underground tunnels were dug below the castle and below the honorary courtyard. Historians have various opinions as to what the purpose was intended for the land under the castle as well as for the several large tunnel projects which were built in the nearby Silva Mountains at the same time. From 1945 to 1946, the Russian army was initially stationed here and lay further waste to the castle. The library, part of the castle, was plundered. It is probable that the better part of the collection, which had numbered over 64,000 volumes, was transported to the Soviet Union. The castle fell into further ruin and was plundered further by locals, and only from 1956 to 62 was some protection provided for the castle, and gradually by the provincial conservator of monuments. The damaged and missing parts of exterior doors and windows were repaired and replaced, so break-ins were no longer possible from that point. During this period, there was found under the courtyard the huge lift shaft dug by the Germans. It was filled in 1967. Also destruction of the remaining bunkers, guard bunkers, were destroyed subsequently by Polish armed forces. In April 2015, one of these missing volumes, the 18th century Saxon Chronicles by Johann Christian Krell, returned to Xiangs. And slowly some of the missing artifacts began to be found and returned to the castle. 1974, a team led by Professor Sofia Vuillon of the Academy of Fine Arts in Gdansk began extensive renovation works in the Baroque rooms. The beautiful wall tapestries of the Baroque salons were designed. Today, these rooms are the most distinguished of the Schanz Castle. In 1991, the Walburg district government became the owner of the castle, and gradual reconstruction of the castle continued from the mausoleum to the copper sheet roofs, and the collection of Hans Heinrich XV von Hochberg and his wife Princess Daisy have returned to the castle after several decades.
is the third biggest castle in Poland after Royal Castle of Wawel in Krakow and the uh, medieval knights of Teuton order uh, in Malburg, but it's the only castle of this magnitude, of this scale, that belongs uh, to the city of Wałbrzych. It belongs to the local government and we are fully responsible for its well-being and uh, as much money as we make by selling tickets, uh, it allows us to invest here and uh, restore the historical substance and there is so much to restore because the first uh, castle in this place was built in the year 1293 by Prince uh, Bolko the first, the strong. Uh, he was from the Polish royal Piast dynasty, uh, but Silesian branch. Uh, and Piasts, uh, as we know them, it's the first Polish royal dynasty, they were uh, stationing, they were owners of the castle for over 100 years. Uh, after that, uh, in the late 14th century, it was inherited by kings of Bohemia. Czech kings uh, got it because uh, the last princess of Świdnica, nearby town, uh, she got married with Charles IV, and uh, this way castle became a Czech property. And as we know, what happened with the kingdom of Bohemia, it became part of the uh, holy Roman Empire of the German nation and this way castle became part of the Habsburg imperial property but until 1509 because in 1509 so beginning of the 16th century it was purchased by Hoburg family at the beginning their name was spelling Hoburg but the history knows them as Hochbergs or Hochberg von Ples. It's a family that owned Castle Książ. Uh, its historical name was Fürstenstein. In English it means princely rock. They owned it for over 400 years, from 1509 until 1943. Uh, and every generation added something uh, to this structure. Uh, we are in the most beautiful uh, example of Silesian Baroque, as we called Maximilian Saal, uh, that was built at the beginning of 18th century by uh, Count Konrad Ernst Maximilian von Hochberg, uh, who was an, an enlightened ruler of this land, and uh, he uh, changed the look of the castle, the outside costume, as they call it, uh, into the Baroque style. Uh, exquisite Baroque style, but even the last owner of the castle, Prince Hans Heinrich XV, Hochberg von Ples, he did huge alteration because he added uh, two monumental wings, uh, the one from the west with true towers and the one from the north. So these parts of the castle, but also a palm house and stables, uh, they were built uh, during the reign of the last owner of the Książ Castle, last private owner. It was built as a place uh, of protection, as a fortress on the border, as I told you. Yes. So many uh, sieges and uh, all kind of difficult situations uh, happened here. Uh, it was uh, surrounded by Czechs many times, uh, by uh, Hungarian king Matthias Corvinus that conquered in the, uh, he conquered the castle uh, in the late 15th century. And then uh, we had, of course, the most tragic war for this area was the 30th years world religious war in the 17th century. Mm, and uh, Hochbergs, they have to escape. They escaped to Poland uh, for a difference and all kinds of uh, armies were stationing here. So Imperial Army was stationing here, Swedish Army was stationing here. Uh, and of course, during the uh, Seven Years' war, uh, war in the 18th century, when uh, this area, so Lower Silesia, became part of the Kingdom of Prussia. 
here you can see all the original decor and the restoration of the castle started in the late 60s. In the 1968, okay. the Polish state started to restore the most exquisite rooms like, like this one. Uh, but it's an ongoing process, it's still going on and it will last, I hope not as long as the last 70 years, but we still have two more floors to go. We started to cooperate with the National Museum in Wrocław in 2013 and since that time we have a permanent agreement and it states that every year uh, the different uh, pieces of art, but also furniture, uh, historical significant pieces for this place will be coming back here. And it's actually happening. And over uh, 400 uh, pieces came back. They are paintings uh, and furnitures from the old Hofburg collections. They were saved by Professor Ginter Grundmann uh, before uh, Nazi took over the castle, before uh, Organisation Todd uh, moved here. Uh, he, he, as a person responsible for the uh, art collections, uh, state-owned collections, but also any uh, thing that has a value here in Lower Silesia, uh, he picked the most viable pieces and transport them to the Schlesische Museum in Breslau and today, as we know, this uh, institution as a national museum in Wrocław. And uh, we were very happy to, to discover they, they are still there and uh, we got involved in the restoration process and many of these pieces, they right now came back to these walls. So history turned its wheel. Uh, this part of the castle is uh, especially important for me because I'm a responsible for a project that is being presented here. Uh, it's an exhibition called in English A Gourmet View of Książ, the lost world of Książ Castle through the lens of Louis Arduin, the chef of the Hofburg court. Uh, what's happened, uh, we found the collection of over a thousand photographs uh, on the glass plates, diapositives. Uh, that they were preserved by, by granddaughter of the cook of the Monsieur Louis Arduin. He worked here for the last Hofburgs at the beginning of 20th century. His granddaughter lives in Canada and she preserved all the uh, pieces, historical photographs from here. And in 2016 we went there uh, to Canada and she shared this collection with us. That's why we can show the lost world of Książ. They are photographs coming from uh, personal photo albums of Prince Bolko and his sisters. So there we present photographs that belonged to Princess Daisy herself. Yes, on the first floor, actually in the northern wing, we show photographs from the personal uh, photo albums of Princess Daisy. Uh, they were given to us by her grandson, Prince Bolko and granddaughters, Countess Beatrice and Countess Joya. You can see uh, these uh, little girls behind me. Uh, they are not the little girls anymore, of course, because Beatrice was the last one born here, uh, last member of the Hofburg family. She was born here in the 1929. Uh, uh, they all visited the castle and they live in Munich. Uh, they are the children of uh, Prince, actually Count Volko and Countess Clotilda, Princess of Ples, before. And in this room you can also see the, all the houses of Princess Daisy. So this is the Schloss Ples, uh, Pszczyna Castle in Polish, uh, her villa in Munich, then the Promnitz, Jagd Schloss, so Hunting Lodge, and Ruthen Castle in Wales where she was born. And here we show 
pla uh, terraces uh, before they were uh, altered by Hans Heinrich 50. Frames that you see here, they come from the original Baroque paintings, but the Russians, they cut it out. Paintings that they were here, and that's why we framed uh, big photographs, we enlarged them, and uh, this is year 1916, during the First World War, uh, when Princess Daisy worked as a nurse of the Red Cross, and Hans Heinrich 15 uh, was uh, adjutant of the Emperor, Kaiser the Wilhelm II. This is their oldest son, Hans Heinrich 17, heir that never get uh, his legacy, and Lexel Alexander von Hochberg, uh, middle one and the favorite of Daisy, and the youngest, the most tragic, Bolko. Art historians, uh, they assume that over 80% of the properties from the castle can be located in the private or public collections in Poland and abroad. That's a... So we basically know where our pieces went, but you know, if someone put hands on something, it's not easy to get it back. That's right. But the cooperation with the Wrocław Museum proved something different, that it is possible. Our wonderful relationship with the Hofburg family uh, that we established in the last 10 years, to, to, I would say 15 years, uh, it's uh, benefited us uh, in an incredible way with the knowledge, with historical knowledge, because the grandson of the last owners of the, ha of the castle, Prince Bolko von Ples, named after the medieval Polish builder of the castle, uh, he shared with us his archives, his knowledge, uh, photographs, uh, personal pieces. He just returned last year uh, three paintings from his own collections that they came from the castle, and they are here, like portrait of his father. It was a medieval vest at the yeah. beginning, on, built on the border between Kingdom of Bohemia and the Principality of Świdnica Jaur, the last independent Silesian principality. Uh, after that, uh, it was uh, property of the Czech kings and uh, Holy Roman emperors of German nations. And after that, uh, they were, it was a property of the uh, family of Hopper. And every generation, as I told you, added something. But that's why we can recognize so many different architectural styles here. We can see uh, Baroque wing, there is a neo-historical wing, and there is a Renaissance wing, and of course the medieval part, that it's the main tower uh, that remembers the uh, times of the builder. On the other side of the valley, because uh, Fürstenstein Zamek Książ uh, in Polish is located on the plateau, uh, on the big rock, and there is a river, Peucznica River, uh, that surround it, and on the other side of the valley, uh, there are ruins of uh, so-called Alteburg. Uh, we call it in Polish right now Stary Książ, and it was a structure that uh, was even older than this castle. Its name was Fürstenberg. The property was always a one ownership, and but still two castles uh, on the two sides of the uh, of this plateau. Uh, they had a. Uh, meaning uh, as all the bordering castles, because when one was attacked, they're supposed to send signals to another one. That's why they were hill after hill, and uh, they were informing each other on some invasion, on some problems, uh, also with the fire signals. Uh, but uh, what we know on the other side of the valley, it's a romantic ruin, that was built on the place of the old castle in the late uh, 18th century by Count Hans Heinrich uh, the VI von Hochberg. Uh, he was cooperating with Christian Wilhelm Tischbein on designing a medieval-looking castle where he held the last uh, real tournament uh, in the world, in the royal world. It happened in the year 1800. Okay. And American president was attending this event, uh, John Quincy Adams. He was an ambassador uh, 
of US in Prussia, in the Kingdom of Prussia at uh, that time, and he visited this castle as well. So he wrote uh, memoirs from here, letters from Silesia. I highly recommend you because you can see how uh, American perceived this area 200 years ago. When the uh, Red Army came here, uh, it looked so old because it was the recreation of the medieval uh, fortress. Uh, so they thought that this is the original seat uh, of the German family and they burned it as a revenge. So, so it existed all the way up until 45? It was a cafe, restaurant, museum, was like the public place of entertainment. So this is what it, this is what you started working with. Yeah, I'm going to send you a picture of this. But that really gives you a good impression as to as to just exactly how extensive the renovations you're doing is. Or so are you just on this floor now, or are you working your way up? When was this added? This was added, do you know when? 1913. 1913. Yeah. And if you're gonna go, go in a place with style. We own uh, original letters uh, sent by the English monarch to Daisy here, and uh, also the copies of letters that she sent it to him. The originals are obviously in the Windsor Castle archive. Uh, so Daisy's uh, sister, she married uh, Duke of Westminster, Bandor, and uh, they were visiting quite often here at the beginning of the 20th century. Her younger brother, uh, George Cornwallis West, uh, he married 25 years older a lady than him, but uh, she was widowed Lady Randolph Churchill, um, mother of Winston Churchill, the first Lord of Admiration, and uh, then, of course, uh, famous Prime Minister of Britain. And uh, Daisy was his aunt by marriage, and he visited this castle three times in the 1905, 1906, and 1913 during the Kaiser maneuvers. But uh, the beautiful stairs that you see, uh, we call them imperial staircase. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, everyone uh, who was important at that time in this world uh, was uh, walking these stairs. So I mean it, all uh, kings of Prussia, the emperors of Germany, Tsar Nicholas I of Russia uh, that came here and Winston Churchill, but many, many others, kings of Saxony and uh, Obviously. even uh, blessed Charles I, the last emperor of Austria-Hungary uh, that visited the castle in the 1910 but also um, John Paul II, as a young priest, he came here in the 1955. At the time of the Second World War, Silesia, wherein the castle lies, was German territory. And soon after, the castle was appropriated, first for von Ribbentrop of the Foreign Ministry, then handed over to the Tort Organization, who initially oversaw many of the adjacent Pratidrisse sites, and construction began here also. Tot organization that before the war was responsible for building uh, highways in Nazi Germany uh, was responsible for this project and uh, it's not only alterations inside of the castle, elevators and rooms and special areas accessible from uh, outside but it's uh, basically the biggest mystery of them all, the labyrinth of tunnels that exist under the castle on the level minus 55 meters uh, below the ground, uh, below the main courtyard. And we opened the tunnels for the first time to public uh, in 2018. Uh, we offer a special road that not only 
tell about the Nazi movements and treasure huntings here in Silesia, but also commemorate the victims. Because we have to remember that uh, the laborers that they were working on uh, digging this tunnel under the castle and uh, all the alterations here inside, they were prisoners of Arbeitslager Fürstenstein. So it was a branch of a Gross Rosen camp. Uh, it was a concentration camp uh, nearby, 30 kilometers from here. And uh, one of the uh, sub-branches was here, little camps, uh, but also all around because uh, this uh, work in Książ in the 1945, it actually lasted until the last days of the war, until May, nine, May 1945, uh, it was uh, all the time continued during that time. It is still not clear what the underground tunnels were actually for. One speculation is that it was for special research, one that I am more prone to believe than that of it being an HQ for Hitler or Lippentrop, given its industrial layout. And after the British bombing in Peenemünde and other German industrial centers, German scientists were, as all other German industry, forced underground or into secure facilities. And already in 1942, workers were brought here to the castle from Italy, followed by 400 miners from the Donbass. In 1944, about 3,000 forced laborers and prisoners were brought to the castle, along with huge quantities of building materials reinforced concrete, steel, cement, sand, transported by wagons to Waldburg. These are amounts that exceed the volume of what we can see today in the underground of the castle, or so far discovered. On top of that, it is worth noting that the construction was under the supervision of the Luftwaffe, yet none of Hitler's HQs were under the auspices of the Luftwaffe. Intense work in the underground of the castle lasted continuously right up until May 10th, two days after the official surrender, despite the fact that Hitler had already committed suicide. Fortress Breslau had surrendered and the command of the German capitulation was signed the day before. It was only the entry of Soviet troops into Waldrich that interrupted the work. It is claimed towards the end of the war, huge transport of large boxes filled with unknown objects arrived at the castle and the underground. We can still find many traces indicating clearly and deliberate blockings of string tunnels. Some years ago, John Weiss, a former prisoner of the Keil branch in Scheins, Gross Rosen, visited the underground of the castle. It was in 1985. He assured that nothing was now like it was in the past when he was there, and tunnels now lack many rooms that he had seen. Part of the underground is currently housing seismic equipment, but the remains can still be visited today. But a lot of investigation is still going on and questions remain. This part, the lighter colored, is uh, for a tourist, but this is with no access, this is part for lab. For many years now, the Polish government seismic lab have been housed in the tunnels here under the castle, sealing off one half of the complex that is roughly in design, layout and cement usage as what we will see. Po pobycie jednego z byłych więźniów Kalgrozrozen Weissa, kiedy był tutaj na dole w 86 roku, wskazał, że w tym miejscu powinna być komora, czyli mamy sztolnię główną, sztolnia komora po lewej na wprost dalej komora i że po prawej stronie ma być komora. To był przekaz. Jeden z poszukiwaczy, znawców tego tematu, Tadeusz Słowikowski, zdecydował później badania. Po otrzymaniu zgody go fizyki yy, udało mu się doprowadzić tutaj do wykonania paru odwiertów. To są ślady po tych odwiertach, tylko to były odwierty pełnym wiertłem wykonywane wtedy. Mniej więcej na głębokość metra, półtora metra. Przeszli ścianę betonową, grubą, około metrową, no i dalej skała. No i tak to się skończyło. Co prawda ten projekt nazwano poszukiwaniem komory Wajsa, ponieważ no, były to prowadzone badania w ciągu jednego dnia i jednak ci, którzy inicjowali te badania nie byli zadowoleni, że to nie jest wszystko, że być może coś się znajduje dalej, no ale niestety mieli zgodę tylko na jeden dzień prowadzenia badań. Otwory wykonano, później zostały zamaskowane zaprawą betonową, no i temat umarł. Temat wrócił po w roku 2012, kiedy druga grupa badawcza 
Dolnośląskiego Towarzystwa. Zainicjowano badania ale już rdzeniowe po to, żeby wykonać odwiert. Mamy tutaj numer 2, 3 i 4, żeby jeszcze raz zobaczyć faktycznie jaka jest grubość struktury skalnej, bo możemy włożyć kamerę i możemy to prześwietlić i jak układa się struktura betonu, co jest za betonem, jak ewentualnie wygląda skała. Najgłębsza, najgrubsze grubsze ściany betonowe miały 2 m 40 cm, czyli dużo i niestety dalej szła skała. Jak, odwie, jak wygląda rdzeń, tam dalej pokażemy. Czyli no, ten temat powtórzony w roku 2000 niestety umarł, ale są osoby, które dalej twierdzą, że ta komora, skoro więźnie pokazuje, że tu stojąc było coś po prawej stronie, że ona jednak w sumie powinna być. No ale jak, jak to można traktować, tego na dzień dzisiejszy nie odpowiemy. I tak naprawdę zmienia się kształt tego przekroju, sztolni. Tu mamy, jak widzimy, ściany pionowe. Mniej więcej w wysokości 2 m 20 cm ściana idzie idealnie pionowo. Za chwilę zmienia się na przekrój na eliptyczny i dochodzą wystające pręty zbrojeniowe. Teraz wiemy co to jest, miała być nagrodowa stropu pośredniego. To są rdzenie po wykonaniu takiego otworu, ponieważ koronka pozwoli wyciągnąć przekrój. Co prawda one nie są jednolite, one niestety pękają, ale to mamy tak, przekrój ściany betonowej. Widzimy dokładnie kruszywo, widzimy uzupełnienie masą betonową. Kruszywo jest, jak widać, jest różne, tak to wygląda w przełomie. A za ścianą tą betonową, czyli po wyciągnięciu takich tego typu rdzeni, wychodziła skała. To jest przekrój skały. Skały, które tutaj występują, czyli mamy jej przekrój jakby przełomu i taki doskonale prostopadły. I to po wykonaniu tych głębokich otworów, tak w tym przypadku na 2,40 m zaczęło się pokazywać coś takiego. Żeby mieć pewność, otwory były wykonywane jeszcze około metra do metra 30. Czy skała jest naprawdę jednolita? No, potwierdza to, że dalej mamy skałę, bo nawet gdyby tu była skała dołożona, wietnica nie wyciągałaby takich pełnych kawałków. Czyli no, badania zakończyły się, powiedzmy sobie, niepowodzeniem, no, ale ta niepewność i sugestie, że jednak może to istnieć dalej, pozostała tak naprawdę do dzisiaj. All right, I will start by pointing out the obvious. They only had one day to investigate something that important and one place in the same wall. The cement thickness was one and a half meters and another place just a few meters away, it was two meters and forty, which is incidentally far thicker than any other wall in any other tunnels I've seen. And speaking of tunnels, here you can see different designs and different shapes in the very same structure, something that's also unusual that I have never seen in underground German tunnels before. You would usually have large working tunnels with smaller intersecting tunnels for utility. Here's the oval egg shape that we're used to even from the east wall tunnels. And then the much wider tunnel system down here on the right. But at the end of it, there's only rock tunnels. At the end of all of these, there are only smaller accessible in bare rock tunnels. So what would they expect to get in here? Now you have to remember there would be a level above this you see with the rebar sticking out. This is where there would be a top level for, for utility. And then you have the little rooms. Oh gee, the door is open. They should never have left that open. Okay, now you have an echo door right here. From what I am being told, this is part of the old seismic lab, dating back from before the 70s. However, this ran up until 1999, where after they moved all the seismic equipment into the much larger tunnels and sealed off that part of the complex. However, what's interesting is what were these rooms originally made for? Generators, ventilation. Certainly, they couldn't have been seismic. Nad wejściami do dwóch komór, po jednej i po drugiej stronie, widzimy u góry wychodzące rury, które przechodzą na komorę. Jest ich siedem. Jedną mamy stalową, prawdopodobnie do, dlatego, że jak tam miał być zainstalowany agregat kondotwórczy, żeby można było wprowadzić spaliny, wiadomo, spaliny są agresywne. Pozostałe rury do kierowania przepływem powietrza, czyli zasysane czyste powietrze. Przechodzi przez urządzenie filtrowentylacyjne, które miały być w każdej czterech komór i są rozprowadzane za pomocą rur na wszystkie tak naprawdę pomieszczenia. Jak popatrzymy, rury po lewej, rury po prawej mają idealne spotkanie, czyli jest możliwość połączenia tego trójnikami po środku i 
do środka obiektu przed nami i za nami można było wykierować i kontrolować przepływ powietrza. Jak wejdziemy do środka, widać jak rury są tutaj również przygotowane do podłączenia. Widzimy tą jedną stalową, czyli tu gdzieś mógł się znaleźć agregat bandotwórczy i spaliny z silników Wizla i przepływ powietrza. Te rury idące pod kątem pokazują jedną rzecz. Tu mamy stare rysunki. Dokładnie wskazanie miejsca, gdzie musi znaleźć urządzenie. OKR, czyli wentylacja. Średnica rury 100 mm, czyli miało stanąć dokładnie po to, żeby podłączyć do, do urządzenia. It is the exactly decided and described uh, level of this point above sea level in meters. Above sea level? Yes. Why? For construction, for example. Ventilation from machinery. There's a lot of ventilation pipes going into this room, into these rooms. Ventilation, field of ventilation. In the case of chemical attack. So these four rooms were basically to house generators, which would make them the best protected generators I've ever seen of any underground or above ground fort. And what were they to power? The tunnels are large but not big enough for industry. So why is there an unfinished part? Do we know? Any ideas? Tu miano wykonać wcięcie do strony dziedzińca, który jest 50 metrów nad nami, wykonać szyb wentylacyjny po to, żeby Było to miejsce czerpni powietrza, czyli u góry jest jeszcze jakiś budynek, którym, przez który przechodzi powietrze, schodzi tutaj na dół i zarazem tędy wychodzi zużyte powietrze plus spaliny, o których mówiliśmy tutaj z agregatów prądotwórczych. So once again, let me see if I get this straight. These are the best protected generators, way underground, under rock, encased in cement. So you build an enormous ventilation shaft straight above, leaving them vulnerable. Something does not compute in my tiny brain. He's still here. If I understand this correctly, these are four backup generators for ventilation. Hmm? Any idea of the purpose of this? Śluza hermetyczna, tu najprawdopodobniej potężne wrota. To są najprawdopodobniej miejsca, gdzie miały być potężne łożyska pod zamontowanie drzwi, które zamykałyby przejście tutaj po to, żeby skrąt był jakby całkowicie oddzielony od y, tutaj możliwości wejścia. I przed nami dwa korytarze idące dalej w kierunku zamku. Jesteśmy w tej chwili centralnie pod dziedzińcem zamkowym i w połowie długości i w połowie szerokości. Ten korytarz po lewej prowadziłby do szybu windowego, ten po prawej pod klatkę schodową. I na końcu dwóch tuneli mamy wyjścia na, na zewnątrz, na zbocze góry, na północ i na południe. But where was the I mean, secure to secure a ventilation area from another part of complex? So that so that was expected to be the ventilation area. Yes, yes. And then the main. This is a place, and second one to install very big doors, panzer doors. All right, I have never seen a ventilator or generator room without small mm -hmm. platforms for the machinery to stand on. And on this side of what is expected to be large armored doors, there's only smaller tunnels and nowhere for ventilated air or electricity to travel through. No channel ducts, no wall hangers for any kind of wires, no utility tunnels even, traveling in this direction on this side of the large hallways. Yet here we are under the actual castle and at pretty much street level. Well, that's new. This is a corridor to a house located on a modern part of Castle Hill. Really? So this is the, is this the unfinished entrance? Or is this the... One is uh, finished, the second one is not finished. Oh yes, I see daylight. Oh yes, this one is finished. 
So I can't help but to see that this is a little unstraight. Now this is an interesting reminder that all of these tunnels, this entire tunnel system, is pretty much at level with one of the plateaus of the castle, which made construction easier as you could run a mini rail around this plateau into the forests and out of the front gate all to the labor camp and straight into the tunnels with equipment and gear and people. However, that also means that the business end of these tunnels were in the opposite end. Here is only an elevator shaft and an out. I was looking for rails. Now they're definitely original. And that wheel is definitely original. Okay, so there's definitely more to this than you just see on your first walkthrough. I by now have not learned one thing. I would imagine this is a dead end. Although I could see slight indents in the ground for the mini rail that would have been laid here for the construction. And here, there's a bat. There's a bat coming your way. at the end of a tunnel. These look like drill cores. But it's becoming painfully obvious that for this to have been the headquarters for Hitler, none of this makes any sense. Why are the drill cores laying here? Why are there four separate independent air conditioning systems? Steel doors. And more rails. This comes out to an opposing side of the castle where we were. So Hitler would certainly not have been down here. There's no accommodations or anything like that. That leaves him to have a room upstairs in the castle that would be highly vulnerable to bombing. All of that completely negates this as a headquarters location for Hitler. I've been to Obersalzburg. I've seen the engine room in the tunnels under Obersalzburg. I've seen the engine bunker at his headquarters out of Wolfslehr. There is no resemblance, and most of the tunnels under Uber Salzburg could probably fit inside these tunnels here. And all the ventilation and generator power, what were they for? It's interesting. I would imagine this is the shaft. This is the shaft uh, in front of Castle, the big one. This is up to the big one. So this was completed. This was the access tunnel. I mean, the main, during the construction. Well, this one of the main a shaft made for big elevator, able to transport cars. Which would then lead me to question, why would you need an elevator to transport cars down here when you could just drive around the castle by enlarging the utility tunnels here on the side? Not to mention the tunnels connecting the various tunnels are not big enough to take cars. Czyli po tej stronie później zanotowana winda. Wrócimy do tego filmu jeszcze raz. Winda, a po drugiej stronie schody, no bo musisz mieć dostęp do windy co piętro. 
the only reason this facility exists and has been built this way is for a very specific technical application. It is certainly not a headquarters for Hitler. He would need four generators or ventilators that would, what, ventilate a room up in the castle where he could merely open a window when nothing is gas tight anyway, and no pipes leads up there. Huge utilitarian elevators, small utility tunnels, and a few very large tunnels, not big enough for industry, but just large enough for their specific purpose. Cave in, or what happened here? That's, that, so this is the other side, other side of the ele side. elevator shaft. So the elevator shaft is in between these two hallways on the other side. So when, what happened to it? Did it cave in or did they destroy it or what, what, what happened? To miejsce, które teraz widzimy, obecnie zasypane, dawniej potężny szyb do góry o przekroju elipsy o tej dłuższej średnicy 8 metrów. Wychodził na dziedzińcu zamkowym. Po tamtej stronie, tamtego korytarza miała być szyb, miał być szyb windowy i jeż, miała jeździć winda. Po tej stronie najprawdopodobniej miały być zabudowane schody, które prowadziłyby bez mała 35 metrów do góry. A to co widzimy tutaj to jest tak naprawdę większość lat 60., kiedy ten szyb został zasypywany z uwagi na bezpieczeństwo tego otoczenia zamkowego na zewnątrz. How many people worked here? Estimated 1,200 1, uh, between 1,500. Can you tell me this? przywożonych tutaj z Grozrozem, który był obozem, który dostarczał tutaj siłę roboczą. Jak dane muzeum podają, w Góry Sowie i do Zamku Księ skierowano ponad 13,5 tysiąca ludzi, więźniów. Tutaj na zamku mówimy, no dane są szacunkowe tylko, mówi się, że ponad 1200 osób przyjechało tutaj. Na zamku obóz powstał 4 maja 1944 roku i skierowano do tego na ten pierwszy dzień na uruchomienie obozu ponad 400 więźniów. To, co oglądamy na wyświetlanym na ekranie, jest to fragment listy transportowej z maja 1944 roku. Ludzie, którzy jechali w góry sobie, przywożeni byli również tutaj, czyli wiemy, że ci ludzie na pewno byli tutaj na Zamku Książ w części i również, na, również w górach sobie. Jeżeli, jakie są, jeżeli dane są, jeżeli chodzi o śmiertelność, tu są problemy, ponieważ to się zbiega z końcem wojny. I nie wiemy, jeżeli Grozrozem w tej chwili po swoich ustaleniach podaje, że w Górach Sowich i w Książu zginęło 4,5 tysiąca więźniów, bo takie są dane, tu na Książu możemy mówić o kilkuset ofiarach. Brak szczegółowych danych. And for good reason, we will question the course horse and numbers later. Yay. So what do we call these? Above ground tunnels? <laughs> 15 meters below level of uh, castle yard. That's very familiar. From the entrance of one of the plateaus of the side of the castle, we're coming down an S-shaped hallway. I know exactly what I'm looking at. This is a close defensive position. Had a machine gun in here. You have grenade dumps near the floor, you have the S-shape to funnel people in front of the machine gun in order to get into the castle. This I understand. Why is there a hole in the floor? See, I mean, this makes perfect sense. Interesting, you yeah. grenade slides on both sides, as well as being locked in here. And there's a door outside. And that plate definitely looks real. That looks like that, that this this I understand. This is exactly what it's supposed to be. This is a close defensive position. This access control and it's well secured. Here the cables running through the guard house is coming in and making a turn in and up the shaft where the elevator up into the castle is. So this is the elevator shaft that was filled up? 
Das ist alle weiter Schöpfung von Hitler aus alle weiter. And it stops here. This is the bottom. Yes, the bottom. Much to 20 meters of height. 40 meters. And it was completely demanded. The elevator was installed and operational. The demand that in in forties, in forties, it was demanded. Bottoms, pulpit, steering pulpit. And these are the doors that they did, as a force, as small windows. Poszerzali, pogłębiali tę ścianę. Stajemy przed wyjściem z windowsobowej, która wykonana była w boku wieży, pokonywała 40 metrów wysokości, w tym 15 metrów pod murami zamkowymi. Wyjście z windy, miejsce kasety sterującej. Winda na pewno była, bo widzimy jeszcze pozostałości prowadnic, które były zamontowane po bokach tego szybu windowego i przed nami jest taka dziwna, dziwne miejsce założone siatką i masa otworów wiertniczych. W latach 70. kiedy zamek myślał o odbudowie tego miejsca i przywróceniu sporo tej windy, no windy były trochę szersze. I żeby ten szyb można było dostosować, wojsko dostało zlecenie, żeby takimi mikroładunkami wysadzić ścianę w szybie windowym, żeby go powiększyć, po to, żeby można było zastosować windę. Robili to żołnierze Wojska Polskiego jesień 1975 roku. Ściana została jakby poszerzona, niestety pomysł później upadł, no i szyb windowy pozostał w tym stanie, jaki mamy. And this, okay, this is a lot. So that's the elevator floor. More double doors. Oh, I don't know where to go first. Oh, now I know where I am. And this is a piece of typical contemporary construction. We've seen exactly the same at the large tunnels at the east wall, where there would be a staircase circling, either an elevator or ventilation pipes. This is something we've seen before and in typical in the Times construction of underground facilities. This is right under the center of the courtyard, right? This is where the flowers are top. Just uh, on front of mine entrance. There is a metal, metal steel plate and then a concrete, maybe four meters thick. Basically, this staircase has been sealed off by a huge steel plate upon which is now the flower bed, which is above in the courtyard. <laughs> this was a staircase. That was, was it installed? Was it installed? And it was there. This is way to big shot. Well, these are a nice original touch for the lamps. Oh, one more time. So a little, a little part. Huh? Oh. Will not hear complaints that the cameras are bouncing. Oh, I see. So this is where it ends. Every but this is, every uh, obstacles they have to uh, to 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 yeah, fill the yeah. shaft. And then there's another one here. Small time. And then there's another one. What another one? This way. This way. This is way directly to the big shop. But if here in this core part in this uh, corridor was a space, then they they insert they throw 
yeah. stones from a booth, yes? Yeah. Here was a space, so this, this, the pill was collapsed to the size. Yeah. So this, to this side. So they, they, they fillet it, and after a couple of years, after collapsing, they, uh, they fill it some more. Yes, they, they, they must uh, uh, repair yeah. again, like holes in the road. Yeah. And this is very problematic because uh, from uh, that yard, this is 50 meters, <laughs> 8 meters to 8 meters wide. It's a lot of money, a lot of space. So during uh, during years, the material was collapsing, still collapsing. Every year, was collapsing. Yeah, of course. They pay, they pay, they pay. Oh. So they decided to use metal, steel rods, concrete, and now the cover. Yeah, the they, this was, there would have been an elevated floor yes. all throughout this. Pipes were the for signal, yeah. for signal cables. To my knowledge, this is the only wartime photo of the large excavation in the front of the castle. Stoimy w tej chwili na dziedzińcu honorowym, gdzie tu gdzie mamy trawnik, był wykonany ten potężny wykop schodzący 50 metrów dół, gdzie miała być zamontowana winda osobowa i klatki schodowe, ale wejście do tego obiektu do windy miało być 4 metry pod nami. Zbudowano szyb prowadzący przez zamek, który widzieliśmy w podziemiach. Zbudowano klatkę schodową. Klatka schodowa jest tutaj w podcieniach. Tu, gdzie widzimy w tej chwili wejście do zamku między tymi trzema drzwiami, metodą odkrywkową. Wyko zdjęto posadzkę, wykopano 15 metrów głąb, wybetonowano, od góry zamknięto płytą betonową. A tu, gdzie my w tej chwili stoimy, miały być pod naszymi stopami urządzenia wyciągowe windy, które zjeżdżały 15 metrów niżej. W parku zbudowano cztery bunkry, które miały bronić dróg dojazdowych do samego zamku. Bunkry wysadzone stały w roku 75 na zlecenie zamku przez Wojsko Polskie, kiedy park chciano zagospodarować i chciano usunąć te wszystkie niechciane elementy z okresu II wojny światowej. Po prostu przywrócić ten park, jak on wyglądał w świetności, czyli te lata XVIII-XIX wieku, a nie pokazywać elementy wojenne. Również bunkry wysadziło Wojsko Polskie. W tej chwili miejsca są całkowicie zasypane, splantowane, nie ma śladów po istnieniu tych bunkrów. And it's time to take a short walk in the woods across the valley to where the ruins of the old castle still remains. So this is literally the mountain where all the tunnel systems are, uh, but way above here is the castle. And then this is the side of the old castle. I see a lot of stairs. Why is history always upstairs? Knights. Knights. Really? Yeah. The last European, maybe, maybe last competition in the world. For jousting. The first written account of the old castle was from 1288. It was originally a wooden stronghold then later fortified by brick. And fast forward through a whole lot of small wars, it was a rebuilt in the 18th century into a romantic residence with an armory, bedrooms, courtroom, prison chambers, a torture chamber and a chapel. Unfortunately, at the end of World War II, the castle was destroyed by Russian troops. However, the Germans did spend some time here. Whether it was for dining or for something else, it's still a little unclear, so let's have a look. It's gorgeous. It and the Russian. It was better before war. You mean it was better before the Russians blew it up? There are fillers. 
for a restaurant's kitchen. Oh yes. The kitchen was on the side, but the restaurant was in. Inside the ruins. What is this? If you answer, you will win uh, one beer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's have a look at this then. Well, I see red brick, which is definitely not part of the original construction. Now I see masonry that is somewhat confusing. Well, I see hinges. I mean, this could very easily be World War II construction, obviously. This, I mean, this is uh, masonry over a steel door or heavy door. That is a very timeless. That dot lines. Ventilation. Uh huh. So we're back to the bathroom again. And this below. Another one there. Okay. Airflow. Airflow. Access. Cement slabs. Access from the book. But this is cement. This is cement with yes, rebar. Cement. Was it prepared? These are pre this, I mean, this looks like anything World War One, World War Two, but I don't see why there would World War One be here. What is this? So if it's not a toilet, no, it's not a cold storage. Oh, well, it could be a cold storage. You have this in your kitchen. The stove? No. The oven? The fridge. The fridge, yeah, the cold storage. Uh -huh. Cold storage? Yeah. Ice was transported from above to maintain the cold. Adequate level of uh, ice from the river, collecting during uh, winter. Uh -huh. Cold air was escaping level, level high, and this was. Chamber free for meat. meat. That's for meat. Ah. It's, just the, it's just the refurbishment where the red brick look, makes it oh. look like it could easily be a lot newer. So the road was coming from down uh -huh. there back then. Uh -huh. Then you have the bridge there. It was coming uh, that and going like a snake. So they bricked up the old main, yeah, I can see that's where the wall was. So this was the main entrance. Now people are coming here. Of course. Here was a toilet. Was Why was there a toilet right here? This is one toilet for a couple, maybe four. Right by the front door after the war, after it was blown up. It would stand to reason the German forces used this restaurant as well, and that's what they did from what we're told. But looking around, I can't help but wonder what else could have been done here, and why would the Russians blow it up of all places? So maybe there is something else to this place. Oh, gorgeous pillar that's just hiding back there. Nice cross. What's interesting about that, still steel beams standing sticking out from that. It looks like a chimney there. Mm -hmm. Don't know why you would have reinforcement bars on a chimney. Oh, what a gorgeous old castle. Absolutely beautiful. arches and everything. That I like what's left of it. And you had the old firing ports for archers for back in the day. And the Russians blew it up because they thought the werewolves were hiding in here. Oh, 
this was destroyed like this. They could have waited it out. That's interesting. Another fire, a little archery mm -hmm. report. Mm -hmm. and that's for archery because it's so it's so tall, right? And there's a toilet. As a toilet. Pipe. There's a pipe. I thought that was a fighting it's position. To... Yeah. And one thing we have to keep in mind here is that these ruins are not as old as they appear. Remember, in the 19th century, this was rebuilt to look like an old castle on the site of the much older castle dating back to the mid 1200s. Yeah, because you would crap over the side of the wall. <laughs> oh, the good old days. I mean, Himmler, he did like castles. And a total archery position. Mm -hmm. Love it, love it. Entrance to the you cellars. Well, there was, there, was, there was a basement. Of course there was a basement. There's always a basement. It's dug, but it's possible to open. Well. So this is one of the this is one of the towers. Uh -huh, looks like this. Big tower and smaller one on the side. Well at least we have pictures of this when it existed. That'll be a nice to compare with. The internet is Our castle is all the way up there. I can understand why she would love to sit here and watch this view. I understand that. I wonder what the Germans used this place for during the war. Oh, and given this is what we could theoretically call a reconstruction, the attention to detail is absolutely staggering. This is such a beautiful remain, I could easily see why this would be able to fool the Russians into thinking it being the original castle. Castle Fürstenstein is worth a visit. It is a beautiful historic location with so much history, both newer and older. And the underground was one we will still continue to investigate, trying to find out exactly what the plan was here. And an added incentive is that you can actually stay in the old knight's quarters. There are several hotels here on location, and the food's actually quite good. And there's a lot of hiking and a lot of interesting surroundings, both very old, ruins, and some dating to the Second World War, of indeterminate origin and function. It's worth a visit, come see for yourself, and maybe you'll run into me there with my Geiger counter. <laughs>